Okay, <coughs> so welcome to the fourth uh, installment. And today and uh, next Friday, we are going to talk about essentially uh, detection. So we want to detect uh, this, uh, these particles of dark matter. And, um, and in particular, we are going to focus uh, then uh, on uh, the galaxy, so on our own galaxy <coughs> and uh, the dark matter that we can hope to collect uh, in, uh, in the galaxy. So the first thing that I'm going to discuss uh, in order to move then to detection is to say a little some details about how dark matter is uh, distributed uh, in our galaxy and uh, possibly also in other galaxies, but uh, we are particularly interested uh, in uh, the Milky Way in particular. So this is going to be a bit of the standard lore of what we think uh, uh, is uh, known uh, at the current time. Of course, uh, this is an open uh, field of research. There are things that are evolved continuously, so take it with a grain of salt uh, in, in any case. So essentially, the tool uh, to understand uh, how dark matter is distributed uh, in, uh, in the galaxy are uh, uh, computer simulations, like those uh, that I showed uh, uh, I think the first day or, uh, or the second day. So those are huge simulations in which you put in a, in a, in a supercomputer bodies, uh, like a billion bodies that uh, have the role of dark matter particles. You let it evolve uh, and see what comes out at the end, so how dark matter is distributed. The only little difference is that the wo those are the distributions that I showed, um, the simulations that I showed on the first day are done uh, on the whole scale of the universe, basically. So you, you take a big chunk of the universe and want to see on very large scales uh, what comes out. While here I'm referring to another kind of the, of the simulations which are done on a much smaller scale because they want to detect uh, how the dark matter distributes uh, on the galactic scale. Mm -hmm. So they have a higher resolution, a smaller uh, field of view in some sense, and they go more into the details uh, of the local distribution of dark matter, with some caveats that I will say later. So basically, things proceed in, in two steps, if you want, just to make it, uh, just to make it schematic. So first step, uh, step A, is that uh, you run uh, uh, n-body simulations at the best uh, of your uh, of our simulations, at the best of the computer possibilities of, uh, of the time, of the current time. And with this, uh, you get uh, uh, functional forms uh, for how dark matter is distributed. So the so-called profiles uh, of dark matter distribution uh, in the galactic, uh, in the galactic halo. <coughs> and then uh, you have to, this come with some uh, free parameters. Uh, so typically you cannot fix everything. There are some free parameters uh, in the functional forms that I'm going to show uh, later. And then uh, you adapt uh, or uh, say fix uh, these uh, parameters uh, using uh, parameters using some uh, safe uh, observables uh, and I will uh, uh, specify what I mean uh, what I mean by that mm. so let me give you such a so say an overview and a, a, a sketch of uh, which functional forms uh, we get from different simulations so first I'm going to plot it actually I have it here so let me show it here I'm going to show a, a graph, uh, which is there, which collects uh, some of the ancient... Uh, I close the door? Yeah. It's going to be warmer, however. Okay. So this is the plot uh, of some of the current uh, and uh, more ancient uh, uh, profiles uh, of dark matter distribution in the galaxy and uh, particularly referring to the Milky Way. So you see, this is the, the dark matter energy density, rho dm, which is number density times uh, uh, the mass of dark matter, essentially. And this is uh, the galactocentric distance. So this is, uh, say, the, this is a log plot, but this would be the galactic center. This is uh, the location of the sun, uh, and this is the periphery of the galaxy. So you see that these are the profiles, uh, the different profiles that come out uh, from, uh, uh, from numerical, uh, numerical simulations. And they are particularly different uh, one, uh, one from the other. So roughly you have, uh, let me just reproduce the plot like this, uh, dark matter and uh, distance from the galactic center. This is the location of the, of the sun, which is, uh, um, say, 8.3 kiloparsecs from the galactic center, roughly speaking. And you have uh, uh, profiles which are something like uh, this. I'm trying to reproduce the red curve there or something like uh, this, 
or something like uh, this, okay? The functional forms, at least the most, uh, the most, uh, uh, the most uh, popular ones are, for instance, the following. You have the so-called Navarro, Frank, and White uh, profile from the name of the authors of the simulation uh, back in the 90s, 97 or 98 or so, which has this, the, following, uh, um, the following functional form. Rho dark matter as a function of the distance is a constant, uh, rho s, time r s divided by r, divided by 1 plus r over r s to the power 2. <coughs> and it's the blue line there, something like uh, this. Then another popular profile is the ANASTO profile which also comes from simulation done by this group, essentially, but it's named uh, in uh, honor of an Estonian astronomer who had uh, proposed this functional form uh, years, uh, years before. And it's uh, something like this. It's slightly more complicated in terms of functional form. So you have uh, rho s and then an exponential of uh, minus 2 divided by alpha r over r s power alpha minus 1. And finally, you have, uh, well, there are several, but let me mention these three as the most popular ones. You have uh, uh, the isothermal profile, trun truncated isothermal profile, which is the red line there, so something like this, whose functional form uh, is uh, simpler. It's rho s 1 divided by 1 plus r rho s to the power 2. Mm. So they, they, these are just fits uh, to the results of the numerical simulations. <coughs> you run numerical simulations with uh, a billion bodies, uh, and then in the end, uh, you see how dark matter is, uh, ends up uh, uh, being distributed uh, in a typical galactic halo. I mean, in your simulation, you obtain uh, hundreds uh, or um, tens or hundreds of thousands of dark matter halos. And you do a fit, and you find uh, the best function that fits uh, uh, your results. And typically, you come out with uh, something like this or something like this. Uh, this is actually a bit more motivated by, say, observation and semi-analytical uh, semi arguments. But still, uh, it's something which is, uh, which is considered. So these profiles are rather different one from, uh, from the other. And in particular, if I look uh, at the uh, behavior for r that goes to 0. So first of all, you, you notice that there are the three parameters that I was mentioning uh, that I'm going to fix uh, later in some way are essentially for all of them rho s and uh, r s. So rho s is a normalizing constant that appears uh, everywhere for them. And r s is something that will set uh, roughly the change of slope uh, in, these, uh, in these curves. It would be something like this, uh, in, this, uh, in, this uh, in these diagrams. So the behavior is different, especially when I go to uh, r equal 0, but also when I go to r equal infinity, so at the very periphery of the, of the star. The navarro franke white profile is, profor is proportional to 1 over r. And instead, it's proportional to 1 over r cube as I go to the outside to the periphery of the galaxy. The Inasto profile, where uh, alpha typically takes a value of uh, 0.17 in most uh, simulations, so this profile here, uh, this parameter here, is instead a constant uh, if you go to the galactic center, mm, uh, a constant in exponential constant some sense, so it goes uh, to a constant very close to the galactic center, while uh, it's proportional to e to the minus r if you go to, to infinity. And the isothermal profile uh, is uh, indeed a constant uh, for a large uh, in, uh, span of uh, distances uh, around the galactic center. The constant is equal to rho s, as you can easily see from here. Send r to 0 and you get just rho s. And it goes with 1 over r squared uh, to, the, to the periphery of the galaxy. So if you remember, fr in, on the first day, we said that, uh, roughly speaking, uh, rotation curves uh, indicate uh, a behavior of the dark matter halo as 1 over r, r, r squared. And this is more or less respected by all these profiles uh, where you are in a, in a regime 
in between a few kiloparsecs uh, and uh, say 20, 25 kiloparsecs uh, from, from the center. Mm. Uh, it's not completely true. You have the, for instance, Navarro Frank and White goes from 1 over R to 1 over R cube. But in the middle, it, you can approximate it with 1 over R squared, and so it goes in agreement with what we said uh, uh, on, the, on the first day. So let me give you some, uh, some remarks about, this, uh, about these profiles. So the first remark uh, is that uh, um, you, we, we are assuming, we are also always assuming the spherical symmetry. Okay, so, uh, so numerical simulations end up having a typically a spherically symmetric halo. So this is what is typically assumed, and indeed uh, you see that I'm using only R as a as a function, as a, as a variable. This is, uh, I would say, r consistent uh, with current observations, although uh, there are some hints uh, of the fact that maybe halos are not completely spherical, but are some, in some sense uh, uh, flattened, like a sort of uh, rugby balls with a longer uh, axis with respect to the others. But for our purposes, a spherical halo is more than, uh, than good for, as an approximation. Now, the other thing uh, that should, you should be uh, aware of uh, is that uh, uh, in the inner part uh, of the galaxy here, these are extrapolations. So the typical resolution of the numerical simulations that we have at, disposals, uh, at disposal these days, uh, and also actually of the observations, uh, is uh, of the order of r larger than 0 0.2 kiloparsecs or so. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that uh, uh, beyond, uh, so in, uh, in, uh, in a region uh, smaller, closer to the galactic center than 0 0.2 kiloparsecs, uh, you should really apply a grain of salt because we are extrapolating the behavior of the curves uh, uh, at higher R and we don't really know what happens here. So this could uh, collapse and have a core as well or it could have uh, some other behavior that we are not really able to distinguish. This is just a numerical simulation resolution. So since you cannot use uh, two small bodies, uh, because otherwise your computing time would explode, uh, you are forced uh, to uh, stop uh, your, uh, your computation, say your resolution, and to declare that beyond this, uh, you don't know what's going on roughly. So just be aware that this is not. Uh, then, uh, so the, the, the crucial observation between these, uh, these profiles is, th is that they are very different uh, at uh, the galactic center. Mm? Say, close to the galactic center. You see that uh, between uh, a core profile, so a profile that has a core such as uh, uh, isothermal, so a constant density for several kiloparsecs uh, around the galactic center, and uh, a peaked profile, such as uh, the Navarro Frank and White, for instance. Uh, so this is typically called peaked, and these are called cored profiles. Uh, the difference can be of the order of uh, four orders of magnitude in density. You see there. Mm? So if I'm looking uh, at uh, a region close to the galactic center, here on the top of the plot, uh, you have uh, the angle around the galactic center at which uh, you are looking uh, if uh, you are focusing uh, on this distance from the galactic center. So one parsec around the galactic center corresponds to looking at uh, half uh, a second, half a, an arc minute uh, around uh, the center of the galaxy. So if you're looking at the very small window there, then uh, you are uncertain about how much dark matter there is there by four orders of magnitude, which is really a lot. So this is one of the major uncertainties uh, for what we will discuss uh, next Friday, that is uh, indirect detection. Signals coming, uh, for instance, from the galactic center will, be major, will have a major uncertainty, which, uncertainty, which is uh, how much dark matter am I looking at. However, on the other hand, uh, they are similar. So these profiles are all rather similar one to another at uh, the location of the sun. So you see that uh, around here, more or less, uh, say in this uh, regime, uh, say between uh, a few kiloparsecs uh, and uh, say 20 kiloparsecs, uh, more or less uh, they are all uh, uh, one like the other. I'm going to tell you later how I fix this parameter, so this is not completely surprising, but around here, basically all the profiles uh, are uh, similar one to the other. Mm -hmm. That means uh, that if I'm looking at a signal 
which is sensitive uh, to the local dark matter distribution, so what's around us, uh, then uh, choosing one profile or the other will not matter much. Right? So there will be much less uncertainty related to that. For instance, such a signal is uh, high energy electrons uh, coming from dark matter annihilations uh, around the Earth. Those will not depend much if I choose this or if I choose this. And <coughs> yeah. Uh, what about the data for large R? Do they have uh, enough? Uh, well, data, data. To R 100, uh, yeah, so data in numerical simulations, the, yes. So at some point, uh, at some point you have to truncate uh, because you say, okay, this galaxy, my galaxy finishes here in some sense. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, yeah, no, particles yeah, that's escape. My question because uh, you, you, uh, you wrote that there is a lower uh, resolution, but the, the, the upper bound on error. So the upper bound is basically given by uh, the, the escape velocity. I'm going to discuss that later. So at some point, uh, if you are uh, too far from the galaxy, the particles, are, uh, even if they have a small velocity, they will escape uh, because they're not retained to the galaxy any longer. And so you say, OK, my halo here evaporates completely. And, but it's uh, far away. And then something that I already said, so the, 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 the final remark, uh, I already said that, is uh, uh, that all these uh, are consistent. I mean, this is the zero level uh, uh, requirement in some sense. Uh, all these are consistent with numerical simulations, uh, with, uh, sorry, rotation curves. Consistent with uh, rotation curves. In other words, uh, I cannot use uh, rotation curves given the current precision that I have uh, on uh, uh, stellar kinematics that we discussed on the first day to reconstruct rotation curves, uh, I'm not able to tell the difference between uh, this profile or this profile. So they are both consistent uh, with the rotation curves, for instance, for the case of the Milky Way. Mm. And that is because, essentially, again, uh, the, pro the profiles uh, differ a lot, but only in the inner part. Uh, and in the inner part, uh, rotation curves uh, are any in any case dominated by the baryonic matter, by the stars and everything else. <coughs> and so it doesn't matter too much whether I have a core profile or I have a peak profile for, uh, for fitting rotation curves. Both uh, work uh, very well. This might change soon because there is a new satellite which is on orbit right now, which is called uh, uh, Gaia, uh, that uh, uh, st started delivering data. I think they gave the first data release and they are going to give the second one soon. This satellite measures uh, with very high precision uh, the position and velocity of stars, uh, of a huge number of stars in the galaxy. And so maybe with, with these measurements, we will be able to see with precision uh, the map with precision the peculiar velocity of stars, uh, <coughs> and therefore be sensitive to the amount of dark matter at the center and be able to distinguish between this uh, and this uh, in the Milky Way. For the moment, uh, I, wouldn't say, I would say that is not the case. Now, the second step, uh, step B, uh, so, so far I gave you the, the, the functional forms, uh, which are here. Step B is a, a bit more subjective. So uh, once you have the results for numerical simulations, you have to select uh, to use uh, some uh, uh, safe uh, measurements, some safe observations in order to fix uh, the two free parameters, uh, essentially RS and, uh, and rho S. So let me give you just an example. This is something we did in a work uh, a few years ago now. What we did is that we said, OK, let's impose that at the location of the sun, the density of dark matter, so rho at the location of the sun, is uh, essentially 0 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube. Mm -hmm. This is a number that comes from, uh, again, uh, kinematical observations uh, of uh, uh, of stars in the local in the local environment, there, there is a full uh, a whole research field on on that and several papers. So you fix uh, the value here of the density, and this fixes uh, one of the two parameters. And uh, second, you say okay, but uh, the total mass uh, of the galaxy, for instance, uh, of the Milky Way, so you integrate uh, over that profile on the total mass, uh, has to be more or less what is measured to be, again, with kinematical, uh, stellar kinematics uh, um, techniques, uh, turns out to be in the one of the latest determinations uh, something like this. So 10 to the minus uh, 5, 10 to the 11 uh, solar masses. So this is the total integral of those profiles. 
this is the value of those profiles at one specific uh, location, uh, the, the, the position of the sun, to conditions you fix the two parameters, right? So uh, you could amuse yourself uh, to fi in finding uh, the values of uh, rho, I, rho s and r s for the different options uh, that, I, that I gave here. <coughs> uh, this value is uh, rather, I mean, it has an, an intrinsic uncertainty, so uh, it could be of the order of uh, 0 0.2 to uh, 0 0.8, something like this, or say a factor of 2 uncertainty uh, around this value of 0 0.3. Maybe right now, I mean, say 8 years ago, 10 years ago, this was the most popular determination. Right now, people tend to prefer 0 0.4 GV per centimeter cube. Roughly, we are in the same ballpark. So, I mean, nothing changes quite changes quanti quantitatively. Qualitatively, it changes quantitatively, quantitatively, uh, because if you have uh, less uh, or more dark matter, your signals will be, as we'll see later today, less uh, or more important. Okay, <coughs> so gives, this gives you an idea of uh, how uh, you uh, simu simulate and reconstruct in some way the dark matter density in the, in the galactic halo. You have to have in mind, then, uh, a sort of spherical halo with uh, a diffuse, uh, made of a diffuse gas, uh, which is much denser at the center, and then uh, goes uh, down in density. This is a log plot, so you see that uh, you lose several orders of magnitude uh, with these typical values uh, for uh, the, the, the parameters uh, at the location of the Earth and so on. Now, so far, I talked only about uh, uh, simulations uh, made uh, with uh, dark matter, right? So only uh, dark matter um, simulations that contain only dark matter particles, uh, bodies uh, that have the role of the dark matter particles. However, um, we know that in galaxies we have also baryonic matter, right? So stars and uh, the black hole, the supergiant black hole at the center of the galaxy, and. Uh, everything else. So adding variance uh, is uh, an important issue. So people right now are uh, doing, uh, starting to do simulations uh, adding variance, where with variance I essentially mean uh, astrophysics, uh, actual astrophysics, uh, and see uh, what is the effect of that is. So these simulations are with dark matter only. If I add variance, uh, how, are they, how are they modified? So how are the profiles uh, modified? Again, this is a super active current uh, research field. There are uh, simulations being done uh, right now, and the results uh, come out every month or so. So I would say that uh, <coughs> uh, roughly the, the, the there are two effects uh, which are uh, going into different directions. The first effect is that uh, when you add baryons, then you add uh, more mass, uh, more matter, say. And that's obvious, no? So you add. Uh, um, protons, neutrons, and baryons, and so on, so you add more matter. <coughs> in particular, matter that condenses a lot, because it's uh, baryonic matter it's a is able to dissipate energy, and so it condenses and forms stars, uh, compact bodies such as stars, uh, planets, black holes, uh, and so on. More matter that, that condenses efficiently. Condenses efficiently. And that means uh, that in the end, uh, you will have uh, a deeper potential, a deeper gravitational potential, and so that means uh, essentially a more cusp, more cusped profile. So, uh, peak the cusp, whatever. So the, the profiles uh, such as this one get even increased uh, by the fact that uh, you have uh, more matter at the center of the galaxy. However. Adding matter has another effect, uh, which is uh, that uh, <coughs> uh, indeed the baryonic matter collapses, forms stars, uh, and stars in particular live their life uh, and then explode. Mm? So you have uh, supernova explosions typically uh, that uh, uh, re inject uh, the material on a larger scale uh, and so contribute to redistribute uh, matter around. This is in general referred to as uh, stellar feedback. Which essentially means what I what I <coughs> what I said. So, in your simulations, when you add baryons, uh, you say that uh, whenever there is a, a region which is very dense in baryonic matter, 
that uh, baryonic matter will form a star. Mm? You let it sit there for a while. And then you say, OK, this star, at some point, uh, after, so I don't know, some million or billions of years, uh, will explode and uh, re-eject uh, the baryonic matter that was making the star at much larger distances. And so basically what you are doing is that uh, you are dissipating away the, pot the, 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 uh, the potential. You are uh, uh, redistribute potential. You are redistributing uh, the, uh, the baryonic matter to larger distances. So basically, uh, you lift a little bit the, uh, the baryonic potential, gravitational potential. And that means that it, in the end, uh, you have uh, a more cored profile as, as a result. You redistribute matter, so you have something which is not uh, so attractive in some sense for dark matter, and so you have that it uh, distributes uh, over a, a, a plateau or a larger distance. Is that more or less uh, clear? So what, I mean, these are two different uh, effects, uh, both due to the fact that I'm adding a significant quantity of baryons uh, in, uh, in my numerical simulations. I would say that the current, uh, and they go into opposite directions, as you see. As you see. <coughs> I would say that the current status uh, is more or less uh, uh, depicted in this plot here from a few years ago. So this plot, uh, which I, I can reproduce here, tells you uh, how, the, how galaxies uh, end up being uh, cusped or cored. So the profiles end up being cusped or cored as a function of how many baryonic matter they contain. So this is uh, the mass uh, in stars, uh, so baryonic matter, as uh, a fraction of the total mass, uh, so or the, or the dark matter mass, so mass uh, of the of the halo. So basically, if you are here, you are <coughs> in a galaxy which has uh, few stars, few baryonic a uh, little baryonic matter. If you are here, you are in a galaxy in which you have a lot of stars, a lot of baryonic matter, right? And here I'm plotting uh, alpha. Uh, which is not that alpha there, but uh, it's uh, the, let's call it uh, in another way, let's call it uh, beta, for instance, which is uh, the power with which uh, the profile goes to zero at the galactic center. So basically, I'm saying that uh, as r goes to zero, to the galactic center, my profile goes to, oops, goes as one to r to the beta, and this is uh, the power beta. So if you have beta equal to zero, that means uh, that we are talking about core profile, right? So a constant profile there. 1 over r to the 0 means a constant. <coughs> if uh, uh, we have uh, beta equal to minus 1 uh, or minus 2, it means uh, that it's going like uh, r to the minus 1 or even more r to the minus 2. So it means uh, a peaked profile, exactly like uh, NFW is doing here. Okay, so it's Similar to R to beta. Similar to? Uh, uh, not beta, if you want negative numbers. Uh, yeah, you're right, yes. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So, this is R to beta because this I have negative numbers here. Yeah. Yeah, correct. So, what that plot is telling me is that roughly uh, from simulations, what you get is uh, something like this. So, basically, well, I should not o overpass zero, something uh, like this. So basically, <coughs> if, you ha if you are in a galaxy that has uh, uh, only a few stars, the dominant effect uh, is that indeed uh, you are adding more matter. And so in the end, you have a profile which is more peaked. So stars uh, contribute to the gravitational potential and makes uh, the dark matter condense more. And so they form uh, a cusp or a peak like this. If you have a significant number of stars, uh, what happens uh, is that uh, instead uh, this effect becomes more important. So you start uh, igniting, uh, creating a lot of stars. Uh, they they explode uh, in large amounts. Uh, and so you have a lot of stellar feedback. You have a lot of this effect. Uh, and in the end, uh, you end up having something which is uh, essentially cored. So here in the middle, this effect uh, dominates. If you have really a lot of stars in your galaxy, a lot of baryonic matter in your galaxy, then you are adding uh, a lot of matter, really. And this effect is not uh, 
uh, able to keep up, this one becomes more important again. So you have uh, a deeper uh, gravitational potential, and again, you have something that goes uh, towards uh, a, um, a peak profile uh, like this. Mm. So this is just to say that situations is a bit fluid. I mean, people are working on this. It's not completely clear what the effect is, but roughly, I think that this is uh, the, current, uh, the current understanding. Couple of other things uh, about uh, the dark matter distribution before we in the galaxy before we start uh, trying to detect it. So the first is uh, that up to now I've talked about uh, the uh, smooth overall distribution. So this is uh, how dark matter is distributed in the whole uh, halo. But uh, as we said uh, already on the first and the second day, uh, what happens is that dark matter keeps clustering uh, on all scales, not just at the scale of the galaxy, but also on scales uh, smaller than the galaxy. So you expect that inside uh, this uh, smooth uh, halo, this uh, smooth uh, blob of dark matter, you have regions uh, where some other little clumps and subhalos are uh, formed. Mm? So you have some granularities and some uh, overdensities uh, distributed uh, around in the, in the halo. And this indeed is, is, this is com what comes out from simulations. So this is a typical, uh, a typical example. I'm not going to give you any formula, but uh, basically you see that on top of a smooth distribution, which is, uh, which is uh, depicted here, you have uh, regions uh, where some uh, uh, clumps, uh, some lumps uh, of dark matter formed, uh, and uh <coughs> which are represented by these, uh, by these dots uh, here. Mm. So remember that uh, on top of the smooth halo, there is a, a finer structure, still uh, determined by uh, dark matter clustering and gravitational uh, collapsing uh, into overdense uh, regions, uh, that typically gives you something like uh, a number of uh, subhalos, uh, or lumps or clumps of dark matter, call it uh, like, uh, like you want. Mm? So this will be particularly important because, uh, as we will see later, uh, if these subhalos exist, uh, uh, then it means that a lot of dark matter is concentrated in those uh, regions. Uh, and so when we'll discuss uh, dark matter annihilation for indirect detection next week, uh, these will be regions will be which will be particularly rich of signals. Mm. Because you will have a lot of dark matter particles there, so a lot of annihilations, and so uh, in principle, a lot of uh, signals, uh, say, in gamma rays or something else. How much exactly of these halos form, uh, where they are located, uh, and what is their de in internal density profile, and so on and so forth? This is a subject to a whole, uh, a whole debate. I'm not going into, into that uh, at all. Uh, even the fact that do they exist or not, so typically numerical simulations uh, tend to find a lot of them, but uh, observations do not show so many of them. So this is, a, in some sense, a, an open discussion. And, uh, Let's see what comes out in the next uh, in the next few years. The other uh, piece of uh, yeah. When you look at the plot, like the one uh, down left. Yeah. Uh, at points. These, these are points? these are the results of different numerical simulations. Yeah. Simulation, but you measure beta and uh, and, uh, and then star. So you yeah. These points have uh, big errors. Ah yeah 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 yeah. I mean these are the results. These some dispersion there, there is yeah, a let's say. Or much bigger? No, let's say, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to say what exactly should. So these are the single results. Uh, this is essentially one measurement. No? So you run your simulation, and you extract from it. You run it maybe tens of times, and you extract from it, uh, I don't know, these uh, 50 points or 40 points. So these are one point, and you cannot associate an error bar to that, because it's just, it's just one result, one realization of your simulation. Now, the scatter of these points around this fitting uh, curve gives you more or less the idea of uh, the, the uncertainties that you have. So if you want, you can associate uh, an error bar of this sort uh, around, uh, around here. Mm. So these are 50 measurements, uh, in quote unquote, uh, um, based on uh, 50 simulations, maybe 30, whatever, simulations uh, done by this group here. So individual results. The other, uh, the other ingredient that I have to give you, uh, that because we will use it later, is uh, uh, the velocity distribution. Mm -hmm. So these dark matter particles 
are uh, distributed uh, in this uh, diffused uh, halo with this profile, but they go around uh, uh, in this, uh, in, in this uh, blob with uh, typical velocities, uh, which are distributed with uh, a velocity distribution that I'm going to write. So this also comes out from numerical simulations. Uh, although, I mean, in some sense, uh, you could have uh, guessed uh, uh, what, the, what the result is. So typically, from numerical, numerical simulations, you get uh, that the velocity distribution of dark matter particles in the galaxy is well fit by a Maxwell-Boltzmann with some parameters that I'm going to Boltzmann that I'm going to discuss, uh, to present in a second. This is more or less what you expect. No? So here, we cannot talk about any thermodynamical system because there is no well-defined temperature. But roughly, you would expect that uh, a gas of some particles distributed uh, almost sp spherically ends up having uh, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So the f of v, the distribution of velocities, is uh, typically given by a normalization constant times uh, e to the minus v divided by v0 to the power 2, and then a theta function for the escape velocity. Mm. So the distribution is uh, a Maxwell-Boltzmann with a typical uh, uh, exponent uh, v to the minus 2, uh, minus v to the 2 uh, in, in the velocity, centered uh, around uh, v0, which is uh, of the order of, uh, say, 220 to 270, depending on the results that you trust, uh, kilometers per second. And then <coughs> you have, uh, so there is a normalization constant here in front, which, uh, if I did the computation correctly, is equal to the last uh, square root of pi v0 to the power 3, so that the integral of this thing, uh, without considering the, the theta function, is equal to, to 1 over all the velocities. And then you have uh, this factor here, which accounts for the escape velocity, which means that uh, the tail of the distribution will be cut, uh, because particles which are too fast uh, will escape, uh, will not be retained by the galaxy, and will escape away. Mm. Typically, the escape uh, for a galaxy like the Milky Way is of the order of uh, 400 to 650 kilometers per second, depending on where you are in the galaxy. Mm. So critically. Uh, close to the center, you will have a, a larger escape velocity, while at the periphery, you will have a smaller escape velocity. Mm -hmm. So this is what comes out typically from numerical simulation. Uh, ah, well, one thing. Um, I'm writing here v f, f of v, not vectorial, right? So this is a, a, the modulus of the velocity, because typically the, uh, the distributions are found to be isotropic. So it doesn't matter the velocity, doesn't matter the, the, the direction. Uh, what matters is just the, uh, the modulus, the, um, the magnitude of the, of, the, of, the, of the velocity. So actually, I should have called this uh, the speed distribution of, uh, of, uh, of dark matter particles. So this is more or less what comes out from our simulations. If you want to see something more precise, uh, this is what you get. So these are actual simulations uh, in the rest frame of the galactic halo. So you see the results of simulations are this uh, red curve with their spread uh, due to the different realizations in, uh, in green. And the, norm the Maxwellian distribution uh, for values tip similar to those that I gave here is the dotted line that you can barely see uh, behind, uh, behind the plot. So roughly speaking, we are there. There, are some, uh, there is some scatter around, some of which is understood, some other which is not uh, understood. It's just uh, what it is. Roughly, this is an illustration of what you, of what you get. Mm. OK, so to conclude uh, the idea this part, uh, to conclude the idea of this part is that uh, you have uh, this uh, uh, blob of dark matter particles uh, distributed spherically all around uh, the galaxy with the typical density where we are located, which is of the order of 0 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube. And with all these particles that are zipping around in all uh, possible directions uh, isotropically, with the typical velocity centered around uh, 200 and something kilometers per second. Okay, so this is the picture that you have in mind if you want to detect dark matter. If you do the computation, you can amuse yourself 
with this typical velocity, uh, this typical density and, uh, and typical masses of particles that we discussed last week, uh, so thermal relics of about uh, a few GV or so, you find that in a volume like this, so a deciliter, say, there are about uh, five, say, particles of dark matter passing in each second in all directions at about 300, 250 kilometers per second. So the challenge is uh, catch one of these uh, that are passing through this, uh, through this volume at, at any given moment in time. Naturally, they interact very little, and so that's, uh, that's why it's difficult to get, to get them. Shall I go on? OK, so let me erase all this. Something I forgot, it's, uh, yeah. So if you do the integral, uh, you are safe for the, you don't get infinity, right? So you can check by yourself. Anyway, it's not important. OK. <coughs> so now we're going to talk about uh, detection of dark matter, trying to detect dark matter. And the first thing which we're going to discuss today is uh, direct detection. The basics, uh, say, of uh, uh, direct detection. So uh, the idea is, uh, well, first of all, whenever I'm talking about uh, detection here, I mean uh, other than gravitational. Mm -hmm. We have, in some sense, already detected dark matter by the fact that it acts uh, gravitationally on galaxies, uh, clusters, uh, and, uh, and so on. We want to de detect it uh, in some other way, so in, in the lab, in some sense. Mm -hmm. And this uh, implies the crucial assumption that uh, dark matter has some kind of interaction other than uh, gravitational with uh, uh, ordinary matter. Otherwise, uh, I would immediately stop talking about it. Right? So this is a crucial assumption that you have to keep in mind, sure, in general. And in particular, I'm going to focus uh, in these uh, two last remaining lectures. I'm essentially only going to focus uh, on WIMPs. Essentially, because this is where, not, not, not only, but most, in most of the cases, because this is uh, uh, where most of the experimental efforts in the past uh, decades uh, happened. So people were convinced that WIMPs were a good idea, so weakly interacting massive particles. And so that is where uh, the efforts are, are concentrated. Some of the things I'm going to discuss can be extended to other cases, but, uh, but not all of them. So we have to, to have in mind that roughly we are trying to detect a particle with a mass of, if you want an idea, around 100 GV, mm, and which has interactions which are typically weak mm, in the sense of the SU2 left of the standard model or uh, comparable, of more or less uh, of, the same, of the same sort. So it means uh, that indeed the dark matter has some interactions, in particular uh, the, the weak ones in, in this case. So this is my, say, uh, exemplar case, both for direct detection and for indirect detection uh, next uh, week, and especially also, for, well, also in the case of collider searches at the LHC. Um, OK, so the basic idea of direct detection is the following, as I mentioned uh, the first day. So we are looking at the diagram that I plotted uh, at some point at the beginning. Uh, we are looking uh, at. Uh, <coughs> the passing of uh, dark matter particles that scatter on one standard model particle in some way dictated by the physics of the interactions of dark matter, <coughs> and the interaction between dark matter and the standard model matter, which I'm not going to discuss uh, uh, essentially at all. <coughs> this will depend on the model. And in particular here, in the case of direct detection, I'm considering the scattering on uh, a nucleus of some uh, uh, detector um, located in, in, my, in my experiment. So the idea is that I have dark matter that scatters on the nucleus. And by the fact that I would see a recoil of the nucleus here, I would see an effect in my experiment. So the basic idea is uh, I take uh, 
a big mountain, such as uh, the Gran Sasso mountain in Italy, or uh, a deep mine in South Dakota, or uh, a tunnel in the Japanese, uh, in the in the Chinese uh, uh, mountains, close to Tibet. So several thousands of meters of rock, and deep there, somewhere, you put your uh, your detector, uh, waiting for one of these dark matter particles uh, to. Uh, fly in, uh, recoil uh, on uh, your nucleus, uh, and give you a signal that you can detect. So the crucial point is that uh, you want to be um, to have uh, a detector which is, uh, say, ultra pure, because you want to reduce as much as possible the internal uh, um, internal effects due to natural radioactivity and so on. And you have to be as much as, pos as possible ultra screened. In particular, you want to avoid uh, cosmic rays uh, that come from the upper atmosphere in, uh, in very large amounts, uh, say muons uh, or other things, uh, that must be absorbed uh, by the rock before getting to your detector. And this is why you go to a place which is uh, uh, as screened uh, as, uh, as possible, like uh, under a mountain or uh, in a mine and so on. And then you also put a, a screen of lead or uh, plastic or whatever in order to make uh, your detector as uh, uh, quiet as possible so that uh, only dark matter particles can, can give you a signal. Well, dark matter particles can give you a signal, why? Well, because essentially they interact so weakly that uh, they can uh, penetrate the rock and uh, one uh, every billions uh, will uh, luckily, hopefully, uh, hit one of your nucleus. And they are uh, heavy enough, uh, 100 GV or so, that they can significantly move uh, the nucleus that you are hitting. If it's uh, too light, uh, you will never uh, be able to have a signal, and, uh, and you will see nothing. So this is a good target for uh, dark, matter, uh, dark matter detection. Now, the problem is uh, that uh, even in this, under these uh, super uh, careful conditions, uh, the background uh, still uh, is not completely abolished. And so you have to uh, rely on uh, some strategies uh, in order to uh, discriminate uh, what is really a signal from dark matter to what is now is a background from something else. So the typical strategies that people consider are uh, two or three. So one is, uh, and let me see, well, later maybe I use the slides, which is faster. One is uh, essentially try to reduce the background as much as possible even more than what I said so far. Background by rejecting uh, all uh, events uh, which are not, uh, uh, which are not uh, uh, due to dark matter. And I will explain what, what it means uh, in a minute. The second strategy, just to write it down, is uh, uh, to use uh, a phenomenon which is typical of dark matter, which is annual modulation. And again, I will explain what I mean later. And the third strategy, which I will just uh, mention or sketch, is that we are going to, people are going to use uh, directional detection. So the first idea is uh, background rejection. So the, the idea here is that um, uh, you want uh, to um, measure all the events that happen in your detector, so 100 events and, uh, in your detector over, over its, uh, its lifetime, its uh, exposure. And for each event, uh, you want to collect uh, two different uh, uh, signatures. So for each, uh, each event uh, in your detector will uh, originate uh, different uh, things. By event, I mean essentially a nuclear recoil. So the fact that uh, something has hit uh, your nucleus, uh, and this nucleus uh, recoils a little bit. So this event, uh, this recoil, will produce uh, some, uh, um, some, uh, some, some signatures. And in particular, things that can be produced are scintillation. So you can have a, lamp, um, a flash of light uh, due to the fact that the nucleus uh, uh, displaces itself in the, in, the, in the crystal. And so some crystals react uh, emitting, uh, the excite emitting light. Or you can have ionization. So the recoil uh, frees some electrons, uh, and so these electrons uh, are free, and so they, they constitute a little bit of ionization, so an electric uh, signal. 
or uh, and or you can produce uh, some heat so basically the recoil uh, produces phonons so you heat a little bit the the, 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 the material, uh, in particular for the case of crystals, uh, and so you have in the end uh, a signal in the form of heat that propagates in the detector. So the idea is uh, that uh, you want to detect uh, for each of one event uh, at least uh, two of these, uh, either scintillation and ionization, or scintillation and heat, or ionization and heat, uh, and be able to discriminate uh, by the properties of what you detect uh, whether what happened uh, is really a dark matter heat or a background heat, background uh, collision. Mm. So let me give you an idea of how this works uh, using the slides because uh, it avoids uh, uh, drawing too much. So I should use the pointer, right? <coughs> yeah. This one. So the idea is the following. Uh, strategy one is, OK, I call it uh, silence the universe there, or actually more scientifically is background rejection. And it's precisely this. Measure two quantities to discriminate event by event what is signal and what is instead residual background that you haven't been able to, to, to kill uh, completely. And I'm going to give you an example based on uh, the theory's perception of what the Edelweiss experiment uh, is. Edelweiss because it's a CA experiment uh, of which the headquarters uh, used to be on the other side here. So the idea is the following. Edelweiss is uh, a... Why? My view of Edelweiss, uh, people from the other department would laugh, but it's uh, a disk of germanium, ultra-pure germanium, which is uh, kept between uh, two electrodes, uh, which are here, at very small temperature. So you have uh, an electric field, uh, and you have uh, very, very small temperature. When a dark matter particle comes in, uh, it kicks uh, one of the nuclei of germanium, and so it gives you some energy deposition, some recoil. So this, as I was saying, uh, can produce, will produce in general, some ionization, so some free electrons uh, here. And, uh, and these will be collected by the two electrodes, because indeed I put a, different op a, di a potential difference here. So you will have a, a, an electric signal uh, due to the fact that you collect some of these electrons. And you, see, uh, you say, OK, so something has happened in my detector there. At the same time, the collision produces some heat, uh, because you excite a little bit the the, the lattice of the crystal, and so you produce some, uh, some, thermal, uh, some thermal excitation. So this heat uh, will uh, propagate uh, through the detector, and uh, since this is kept uh, at very small temperature of the order of 20 millikelvin, this will modify slightly the uh, conductive properties, uh, the resistance properties of the, of, the, of the circuit here. And so, essentially, as this plot says in some way, when you have an effect like this, you will have that the resistance of your circuit will uh, increase by a little amount, and you will be able, able to say that something has happened. Mm. So we are collecting both heat and ionization in the same, from the same event of uh, nuclear recoil that you got. Now, the crucial point is to realize that uh, the heat and the ionization ratio, so the percentage of uh, ionization and heat which is deposited by different events, is different. So if you have uh, a typical background event, uh, which is, uh, say, a, this is my cylinder of germanium, uh, which is, uh, say, a high energy gamma ray coming from, uh, from, um, from natural radioactivity that produces uh, a, an event uh, here, you will have uh, that uh, the ionization over heat uh, collected by in, in this uh, case uh, will be of the order of uh, 1. So essentially, in some units, uh, you deposit as much energy in ionization and uh, in heat uh, if uh, the effect that you're looking at uh, is uh, a gamma ray that uh, typically heats uh, a, um, a, an electron that deposits some energy. If instead uh, the event uh, that happened is uh, truly a dark matter particle that uh, got in uh, and uh, hit uh, one of the nucleus of your detector, you have that this uh, ionization over heat uh, ratio is of the order of, say, 0 0.3 or, or something like that. Mm. So you can realize uh, plots like these uh, that are typically presented in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the papers of um, the collaborations in which you have the heat uh, over ioniza ionization over heat ratio as a function of the recoil energy which is deposited, so how much energy you collect uh, in, this, uh, in these events. So in this band here, around one, you will have uh, events which are due to the background. Typically, a gamma ray that gets in, uh, and you don't want to do that. So you reject all those events and throw it away. 
In this band here, around the 0 0.3, around the third, you will have uh, only, in some uh, approximation, only truly signal events uh, such as a dark matter particle that hits, uh, that hits your nucleus. Indeed, this is what you see, for instance, in calibration data in which you have uh, a gamma ray source uh, and a neutron source. Uh, a neutron uh, uh, simulates uh, well uh, a dark matter particle getting in, uh, and you see that uh, you populate uh, two different regions in the parameter space. So in the true experiment, uh, you throw away all uh, these signals here and say, OK, these are events that they don't care about. But if something falls uh, in this fiducial region, in this, con in this uh, uh, signal region uh, around there, then you say, OK, something has happened. And this is uh, a dark matter detection. This is, for instance, the result of CDMS uh, uh, in 2009, uh, end of 2009. So you see that uh, at the time they were reporting uh, two events, uh, which the with the good characteristics, uh, so in the signal region, collected at some point in time uh, while they were uh, exposing your detector in the, in, in the mine. Now, of course, uh, with two events, uh, you cannot do much because uh, you, I mean, there is a, an irreducible uh, background that is there anyway, which is of the order of, say, one event or a fraction of event. So if you have two, you are not really able to say, OK, something happened or, or not. It might be a fluctuation. Or so the situation is, uh, in some sense, uh, not optimal. But they, you get the idea. So you have to sit there, wait, reject all the events that uh, end up uh, in the upper area, and select only those uh, that interest you. The second strategy is called uh, annual modulation. <coughs> and again, uh, uh, so basically here we have used uh, the fact that uh, uh, dark matter has a peculiar signature, which is this uh, uh, ionization overheat, uh, overheat ratio. The, in the case of annual modulation, we are looking for another peculiar signature, which is uh, the um, cosmic origin of the signal in some way. And I'm going to explain you why. Cosmic origin of the signal. So here, what I do is that uh, I, I put my detector underground, the screen, the whatever. I do uh, at best what I can do. And I collect all the events. I don't throw them away. So I collect all the events that I get in the detector, hundreds or, or even more. So I collect all of them and, uh, and uh, measure and collect all of them and look for a possible annual modulation of, uh, uh, of their uh, rate. So the fact that. Uh, uh, there are more events in some periods of the year and less and fewer events uh, in some other period of the year. Why should, uh, should there be a annual modulation? Well, because, uh, as I said, uh, so I will not reproduce the drawings uh, since they are there. <coughs> we are in the galaxy, so we are sitting in this uh, spherical halo of dark matter particles, which is uh, isotropic, so they're going in all the directions. And uh, as you know, the galactic, uh, the galactic plane uh, is uh, rotating in some direction. So the sun is rotating around the galactic plane, uh, is rotating together with the galactic plane in uh, this direction. So basically, the sun is going uh, against uh, a wind of dark matter particles, uh, which comes preferentially from this direction rather than this direction, right? Because we are going against, uh, like, uh, when it rains from all directions, if you run in one direction, uh, you get wet uh, on the front, but not in the back. On top of that, uh, the Earth uh, is uh, rotating uh, in the same direction of the sun uh, in the <coughs> summer and uh, in the opposite direction than the sun uh, in the winter. So in the summer, in the summer typically uh, with the peak around uh, the beginning of June, uh, the Earth is uh, summing its direction with respect to, to the one of the sun, and so it will have uh, uh, an even larger wind of dark matter particles impacting on it. While in the winter, it's escaping, it's going in the other direction, and so it will, it will have a smaller dark matter intensity of the wind of dark matter particles impinging on, the, on it, on the detector. So you do expect uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the signal is modulated uh, in the following way. So you do expect that uh, in the summer you get uh, more events, uh, because you're running against uh, the wind uh, with more velocity, more speed. And in the winter, you get uh, fewer events uh, because you're running away. And this is indeed what, uh, for instance, uh, this experiment, uh, DAMA, 
uh, has been finding uh, since uh, several years now, about uh, 18 years uh, or so, with a very large uh, statistical significance of the order of, uh, I don't know, more than 10 sigmas. So they find that indeed that their experiment uh, collects uh, a lot of events uh, and uh, their number is modulated like this, uh, exactly in the way you expect it to be modulated because of this effect, of this uh, cosmic origin of, uh, of the signal. Mm. So everything is consistent uh, in, uh, with the dark matter uh, interpretation. So the, the phase uh, is exactly what you expect uh, in the dumb experiment, uh, of the order of uh, a peak uh, at the beginning of June. The amplitude is also very good. So you would expect this, uh, this, uh, this amplitude of the modulation. The problem is that uh, you don't know whether there are other backgrounds uh, that uh, also have uh, a modulation uh, in time uh, like this. So this is still an open issue. People have discussed the possible sources of, uh, of background which are modulated in time. And all the, all the point is being able to distinguish between the two. Just to give you an example, which I think it's refuted by now, but uh, so this is sitting, the experiment is sitting in the Gran Sasso lab uh, under the Gran Sasso mountain. And some people have suggested that uh, the natural radioactivity in the rock um, is larger in the summer than in the winter, not because the radioactivity changes in, in time, but because the temperature of the rock is different in, in, in winter and summer. And so uh, there is more water in the rocks surrounding, and this brings more uh, radioactive material around the detector, and this brings more uh, effects uh, in the summer rather than the winter. Or people have thought that maybe some residual cosmic rays are coming from the upper atmosphere reach the detector more easily in the summer because the atmosphere layer is um, warmer during the summer and so in some way they get there more easily blah 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 so there are lots and lots of possible interpretations yeah exactly this is what you're doing there is an experiment which is called uh, sabre i think which is which is being done in australia uh, i don't think there are results yet but this is what i mean I'm simplifying things a lot. Uh, this is a super pure experiment which has been taking year, year data since uh, years and years. They have a technology which is uh, unparalleled by, by the other experiments, so it will not be so easy to throw them away. But yes, this is what you, you should do. Yeah. If you see an anti-correlation, then it's background. If you see the same correlation, then it's, uh, it's, uh, it's dark matter. Finally, uh, let me just uh, 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 sketch uh, the fact that you can also um, use a third strategy which is a directional detection so the idea here is uh, even simpler than before it's just the fact that uh, if uh, indeed uh, dark matter is uh, producing the, event in your, the events in your detector then uh, these events uh, would mostly come uh, from uh, the direction of the wind which is coming against uh, against the earth no? so you would expect uh, a dipolar distribution with uh, more events are coming from uh, here because the, the earth is running against the wind and fewer events are coming from uh, from here so the, the, the back coming in hitting the detector from the back now this is a uh, simpler to simple to say but uh, it means that you have to have a detector which is able to uh, distinguish uh, the direction the incoming direction so in the example that i gave before like edelweiss and so on you just see a heat deposition or uh, ionization or light but you're not able to say whether the dark matter particle came from this wind uh, this direction or the other one so you have to devise detectors that are able to in some way see the recoil uh, of the nucleus and reconstruct uh, based on that uh, where the dark matter particle was coming from which is not uh, which is not trivial then the distribution of these uh, recoils also depends on the properties of the dark matter particles. So in the end, if you see something like this or something like this, you will be able to, uh, this is the angular distribution of, uh, of the possible events, uh, you will be able to say whether it's uh, one kind of dark matter or, or the other. As far as I know, there are only a bunch of experiments which are trying to develop uh, this uh, structure here. One is here in, in, in France. And, um, and it's promising but challenging because of the technology which is involved. So let me stop here and go to some technicalities uh, about direct detection uh, later in the second hour. OK, so let's continue. And uh, <coughs> now we're going to do a little bit of uh, looking a little bit into the technical details of uh, how direct detection works. But it will be very, uh, it's just basically kinematics and nothing more. So we are looking at uh, 
a nuclear recoil, right? So uh, there will be some uh, recoil uh, energy, which is uh, deposited energy. Uh, so the event that, are, uh, that we are looking at is indeed uh, uh, dark matter hitting uh, a nucleus, which is uh, initially at rest. So dark matter comes in, uh, dark matter comes out. We'll discuss a little bit more in a second how it works. And you have uh, the nucleus uh, that uh, recoils uh, with, a certain, uh, with a certain energy. So this, uh, if you see it in the center of mass, is essentially uh, a collision between uh, a dark matter particle and the nucleus uh, of uh, elastic scattering like this. So dark matter, dark matter, and uh, this is the nucleus and the nucleus. So if I define uh, this, I think, uh, to be the angle uh, theta star in the center of mass, <coughs> you understand uh, the, the kinematics that goes, on, uh, that goes on here. So the energy which is deposited, uh, the recoil energy that the nucleus uh, uh, gets, uh, simple kinematic tells you that uh, it's given by mu squared, velocity of the dark matter particle squared, divided by the mass of the nucleus, 1 minus cosine theta star. Just, uh, I, you should remember this from first year, undergrad. Where mu is the reduced mass, which is equal to mass of the dark matter particle times mass of the nucleon, nucleus divided by the sum. Okay, so just for future reference, uh, you understand immediately that uh, if uh, uh, the mass of the dark matter particles, particle that we are considering is uh, much smaller than the mass of the nucleus, uh, this basically reduces uh, to the mass of the dark matter particle. Shall I call it X or DM? Let's call it uh, always DM. If instead we are in the opposite situation, so the mass of the dark matter is much larger than the mass of the, of the nucleus, this reduces to the mass of the nucleus, uh, which is heat. And just to give you an idea, so which uh, kind of, uh, uh, we, we said that dark matter masses uh, are around, uh, say, 100 GV, those that we are considering in the case of uh, direct detection here. Which kind of nuclei we are talking about? Well, for instance, I talked about uh, uh, germanium, which has uh, a, mass, uh, uh, a, a mass number uh, which is denoted, uh, which is denoted uh, A, I think, uh, of 72, I think, uh, an atomic number of 32. Or we are talking about uh, noble gases, uh, such as uh, argon, that has an atomic number, uh, a mass number of 40. So typically the mass of the nucleus is 72 GV or 40 GV. Or we are talking about uh, xenon, uh, which is a rather very popular target uh, with uh, an atomic mass number of 131. So or, for instance, uh, sodium and iodine, which are the experiment, which are the nuclei in the DAM experiment that I showed before, which are lighter. I don't remember the numbers, so don't put them there. But roughly, we are talking about uh, tens or hundreds of uh, GV. So roughly, we are in the same ballpark. And this will be, I mean, should be already clear, but it will be even more clear in a, in a moment. We have to be around the same values uh, as the dark matter mass that we have uh, in, in mind uh, of uh, collecting. So let's uh, estimate uh, how much uh, this uh, deposited energy will be. So if I assume, uh, let's, say let's, let's estimate uh, ER. If I assume uh, a mass of uh, dark matter of the order of 100 GV and the mass of the nucleus of the order of 100 GV, because this is what we are talking about, I said uh, before, <coughs> earlier today, that the velocity of the dark matter particles is of, is of the order of 10 to the minus 3, the speed of light, so 300 kilometers per second, ra ra roughly, so 10 to the minus 3, the speed of light. And for simplicity, let me take uh, theta star to be uh, pi, so 180 degrees, so head-to-head -to -head, uh, uh, collision. <coughs> then if I do the number correctly, this turns out to be 1 fourth 100 GV squared. So the 1 fourth comes from the fact that uh, mu is essentially 100 GV divided by 2, if you do the computation in, in the case of two equal masses. And, uh, um, and uh, then I have a 10 to the minus 6 a C here. And then I have 100 GV here from the mass of the, of the nucleus, which is heat. And so in the end, uh, 
I end up having a 25, 100 divided by 4, 25, 10 to minus 6, so 25 kV. Okay, so this is the typical energy which is deposited in, the, in, in, your, in your detector for these uh, conditions of, uh, typical conditions of uh, the physics that we are considering. So this is uh, a good number in some senses because, in some sense, because it's uh, large enough that uh, you can detect something. So typically with 25 keV of energy, you have a significant deposition of ionization or heat or scintillation, so you do see something happening in your detector. But it's not too large in the sense that uh, the nucleus, which is heat, uh, is not disrupted. I mean, it, we are not talking about nuclear energy processes. We are talking about, uh, say, hard uh, atomic uh, processes. So basically, this is an elastic scattering in which the nucleus just recoils uh, without being uh, touched, in some sense, uh, without being disrupted, but still with a significant, uh, significant uh, energy, energy deposition. OK, so um, what the quantity in which uh, we are interested uh, is uh, the uh, distribution of uh, recoil events. Uh, so let me write distribution of uh, recoil events uh, as a function of uh, ER. So the recoil energy. Mm -hmm. So I write it as a delta gamma over the ER, the, the recoil spectrum in some sense. This will be given by the, simply, by the flux of dark matter particles which are impinging in your detector uh, times, uh, let me say something like, times uh, the scattering cross-section for this phenomenon to happen. Differential scattering cross-section, so DR over uh, D, scattering D sigma scattering over DER. So the probability of scattering uh, for unit uh, deposited energy ER. So the flux here, the flux of dark matter particles which are, which are impinging is just uh, given by the number density of dark matter particles uh, here at the location of the Earth, where our detector is located, times uh, the typical velocity of the dark matter particles uh, which are going around uh, in all directions. So this will be... Uh, well, the number density is uh, the density in energy, the energy density at the location of the, of the sun divided by the mass of the dark matter particle. And this is uh, the famous 0 0.3 GV per centimeter cube that we, that we discussed before. And then the velocity, okay, as I said, that there is not one single velocity, but there is a distribution of velocity. So let me write this as, a, as an integral over a certain, uh, so over dv of, uh, from v min to v max uh, of uh, uh, the velocity times the distribution of velocity, as a, which, I defined, uh, which I defined before. So integrating over the whole distribution. This f, f of v is the same uh, that I gave before, so it was something like, uh, it can be approximated by, by, by Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, so something like uh, this, uh, right? So the, the exponential uh, like this. Now, what is V mean? Well, V mean, well, V max is easy. Now, V max uh, is uh, the escape velocity. As I said uh, before, I can put it here as a theta function or here as a, the, the, the upper limit of the integral. It's exactly the same thing. But what is V mean? So V mean is uh, the minimal velocity <coughs> that I can have if I want uh, this specific energy, uh, this specific energy uh, E star, uh, e, e R, sorry. And uh, this turns out to be V min equal to E R times mass of the nucleus divided by mu squared times 2 under square root of 2. Mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, uh, turning around that uh, equation there just putting uh, theta uh, star uh, maximal just for, uh, for the sake of illustration. So this is the minimal velocity that uh, the particle must have uh, in order to give, in to, to give me uh, ER, right? So uh, I can write down 
uh, is that what I need? Yeah, and then uh, the, the, the scattering uh, here, the, the differential uh, uh, sc scattering cross-section, let me write it down. Since we are talking about isotropic systems, let me simplify it a little bit by calling it uh, theta scattering divided by ER, so that uh, ER maximal, so that uh, I don't have to deal with angles uh, or, or anything else. So if I want to write down this quantity here, shall I push it? Uh, yeah. This quantity here, the delta gamma divided by uh, over the uh, e, e r, so the uh, differential distribution of recoil events, uh, and I want it to, to write it down <coughs> by unit mass of the detector. So let me write it as uh, the r now divided by the r. So this is uh, the distribution of recoil events. Uh, Going uh, like before, per unit mass of the detector. Detector mass. So I will have to take uh, the quantity above uh, and divide by the mass of the target, so the nucleus that I'm considering. And so this gives me. Uh, do I fit here? Yeah, let's see. So I get uh, 1 over the mass of the nucleus times uh, rho O dot divided by mass of dark matter times the integral over the velocities uh, of v, f of v, times the sigma scattering divided by 2 mu squared v squared mass of the nucleus. Mm? I'm just uh, reusing everything that I, that I described before. This is uh, from v min to v max. So this quantity simplifies. The mass of the nucleus uh, is not relevant, is not explicitly present here. And what I get is uh, rho, rho dot divided by the mass of the dark matter, sigma scattering divided by 2 mu squared, and then the integral. OK, so if I do the integral uh, explicitly with the form uh, of the Maxwell-Boltzmann that I've written here and with the v-min uh, that I've written here, this uh, gives me 4 pi e to the minus uh, er divided by no, times m nucleus divided by 2 v0 squared mu squared the whole thing divided by constants okay so let me call this quantity here e r 0 just for the sake of notation so in the end i will have that uh, the dr over d is equal to rho zero, rho dot, so location of the earth, divided by the mass of the dark matter, times uh, sigma scattering, divided by root of pi, mu squared, v zero, e to the minus e r divided by e r zero. Okay, so this is uh, the observable quantity. Well, not exactly, but it's uh, uh, close to the observable quantity. The recoil spectrum as a function of the deposited energy will be given by this uh, rather simple formula that, uh, that you have there. So you see that uh, naturally it depends uh, on the local density of dark matter. You have more dark matter, you have uh, more events. Uh, it depends on the scattering cross-section. It depends on how the velocity is, uh, is distributed. 
and it depends also on the mass of the dark matter and the mass of the nucleus which is still contained inside the reduced mass here and inside the ER0 that I have defined, uh, that I have defined here. So the ba basically the I have as a three parameters, I mean I can play with uh, the mass of the nucleus uh, that, I'm, uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'm using uh, and that will uh, determine the, the mass of the nucleus and the rest are physical constants uh, with which uh, I can uh, play if I want to detect the dark matter with a certain mass and a, and a certain uh, scattering cross-section. So let me plot some examples uh, of these uh, uh, recoil spectra, which are, which are given here, just to give you an idea. <laughs> so if I keep the mass of the dark matter fixed, uh, then uh, what I have uh, are, um, this is the recoil uh, energy, basically, uh, the deposited energy. If I keep the mass of the dark matter fixed uh, at uh, 40 GeV in this example here, and uh, I modify the mass of the nucleus, I have uh, this peculiar form of the of the recoil spectrum. So you see that uh, you get a lot of events uh, at uh, small recoil energy and uh, few events uh, at uh, large recoil energy, deposited energy, with a slope that depends on the mass of the nucleus that you hit. So from 5 to 160. And if uh, instead I fix the max of the nucleus uh, with that I'm using, uh, say in this case a germanium detector, and uh, I modify the mass of the dark matter that I'm trying to detect, uh, same thing, uh, you see a lot of events uh, at small uh, recoil energy and uh, fewer events uh, at large recoil energies with uh, uh, different distributions, uh, different slopes uh, depending on the mass the, of dark matter that you, are, that you are trying to detect. So don't be fooled by, by these plots in the sense that these are log-log plots, uh, as, uh, log linear plots, uh, as, you see in the, as you see there. So the, the truth uh, is that, uh, I mean, experimentalists are looking not at something like this, but at something like this. So in, as a function of the recoil energy, the distribution of the spectrum, uh, the, 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 recoil, uh, the recoil spectrum will be something very peaked at small energies and very suppressed uh, at uh, large energies. Since your experiment will typically have a threshold, so you will not be sensitive to, to little recoil energies, just for the... I mean, you cannot detect less than one electron, say, or less than a uh, flash of light with a certain intensity, then uh, you will be sensitive to only this uh, portion of the, of the recoil spectrum, which makes it, uh, which makes it particularly, particularly challenging. So if uh, you put your detector there, and it sits there for, say, months uh, or years, if you see some events, then uh, you, so first of all, the number of events uh, that you collect uh, is of course, uh, given by the mass uh, of the detector that you put there, so three kilograms of germanium or a ton of xenon or whatever, times uh, the time uh, of exposure, so how many days or months uh, you leave it there, and then uh, the integral over of the quantity that I, we just computed there. So something like this between uh, a certain threshold of your detector and uh, if you want uh, infinity, so let's say the highest energy that you, that, uh, that you can collect, mm? integrated over the ER. So basically the, the, the quantity that the experiments uh, report uh, is uh, this number of events here. We have seen uh, yesterday, we've seen before CDMS that reported two events uh, over a certain amount of time and a certain amount of detector exposed, and this is uh, this uh, number N, uh, number N there. So if you see some events, uh, then uh, you, uh, you, you, you say, OK, there, there, is some, there is some signal. And then you have to try to fit. You plot them over the recoil spectrum. So recoil energy, number of events that you have seen. And you try to fit with the best function for dr over dr, over dr that depends on the different parameters here. If you see no, ev no events, instead, you put a bound. So if you see some events, so let me plot something here. Okay, let's, let's stick here. So you go on your plane 
which is a uh, mass of the dark matter particle and uh, scattering cross-section. If you see some events, uh, you will have uh, a blob where you fit uh, this quantity and this quantity using uh, that formula with the distribution that I just uh, sketched uh, there. Keeping in mind that you have assumed something for the quantities, uh, that uh, the, the physical parameters that enter here, that, uh, uh, that you are, uh, for which you are assuming some values. So in particular, this quantity here, um, this quantity here, or, in, or in more generally, the distribution uh, of uh, velocities, uh, and possibly also the, the nuclear effects uh, that, are, that, are, that are involved. If you instead uh, see zero events, uh, then uh, you will typically have an exclusion co contour that an exclusion contour that will have uh, this uh, shape. So this uh, region here will be excluded. And this can, uh, the shape of this exclusion contour can be understood uh, uh, rather, rather easily because it comes from simple, simple, um, from some simple uh, physical facts. So here it goes uh, as uh, one over the mass of the dark matter. So larger mass means uh, uh, less constrained uh, scattering cross-section. And that is uh, because just the, the number density of dark matter particles that are impinging on your detector is inversely proportional to the number of, uh, to, to the mass of the particle uh, of dark matter itself, as you can see here. So the mass of dark matter, apart from showing into the reduced mass, enters explicitly there as 1 over MDM. Naively, physically, what this means? It means that uh, if dark matter is a heavy particle, then in order to reproduce uh, the density, the local density, 0 0.3 GV per centimeter cube, there must be fewer of them, right? And so you have uh, a smaller number density, and so fewer hits, uh, so fewer events in the detector. The other way around, if dark matter is uh, lighter, then uh, you have uh, more uh, of them around uh, to give the same energy density in total, and so you can hope to have more events, uh, and the constraint, uh, if you see nothing, uh, is stronger. <laughs> On this side here, instead, uh, this is uh, just a cutoff, which is actually typically sharper than this. So it goes up uh, like this. And this is uh, simply the effect that uh, the recoil uh, energy which is deposited uh, if the mass of the dark matter particle is very light, uh, is uh, less uh, than uh, the threshold of your detector. Mm -hmm. So you should think uh, in, in the following sense. So if dark matter is very light, uh, it's like, uh, and, and your nucleus uh, has a certain mass, uh, it's like uh, hitting uh, uh, with a ping pong uh, ball, uh, a bowling ball. So you will deposit zero energy, basically. The ping pong ball will uh, recoil against it, and you will see nothing there. So if dark matter is very light, uh, it hits uh, your xenonucleus or ping pong uh, or bowling ball, but it deposits essentially nothing. And so the threshold, uh, you are below the threshold, and you will see nothing. And so you cannot put any constraint. And this is why the constraint goes up. In some sense, there is this point here, which is a sort of sweet spot which is uh, corresponding to the case in which the mass of the dark matter is of the same level, of the same order as the mass of the nucleus that it hits. You can show rather simply that more or less uh, this is uh, uh, the, the value uh, for which uh, your detection capability is uh, uh, maximal, maximized. So you understand that it's important to use different nuclei, xenon, germanium, sodium, uh, argon, and so on, because if you change the nucleus, uh, these uh, exclusion contours uh, will shift around uh, in one direction or the other, depending on, uh, on the kinematics, simply. <laughs> OK. Um, now, there are refinements that I'm not going to talk about, uh, such as uh, uh, the fact that uh, I, haven't, I have simply put here the velocity distribution in the galactic frame, but as you remember from that plot, we should convert into the frame, uh, rest frame of the Earth, uh, which includes the velocity of the Earth around the galaxy, which is another uncertain parameter, blah, blah, blah. And also, I mean, I'm being a bit sloppy about the escape velocities. But anyway, roughly speaking, this is, uh, 
this is the picture that you get. So let me discuss a little bit uh, uh, the scattering uh, cross-section there. I mean, not just not discuss, but just uh, give you some ideas. <coughs> Let me see how much time I have. Yeah. Well, I leave it there just in case. Okay, so the scattering cross section will be determined by the, by the particle physics. So, so uh, it's essentially what was inside the blob that I, that I, just, uh, that I just erased it here. The problem is, however, that uh, the particle physics gives you the scattered cross-section between, uh, uh, say, fundamental particles. So in particular, the, the dark matter that is coming in and the fundamental constituents of matter, which are in particular, say, the quarks. Right? So I can uh, predict from particle physics, uh, or I can compute from particle physics if I have a model for uh, uh, dark matter, ordinary matter interactions, uh, the scattering over quarks. So for instance, I can consider the case in which uh, these scatters are uh, exchanging the Higgs boson. Mm. Or I can consider the case in which uh, these scatters are uh, exchanging uh, a Z boson, the typical uh, uh, case uh, of uh, WIMPs that have uh, electroweak uh, uh, interactions. So on quarks, uh, my microphysics uh, can give me expressions uh, for sigma scattering of dark matter over uh, dark matter over a, over a quark, say. But, but then I have to convert this uh, to uh, the same quantity for the scattering of uh, dark matter over a nucleon. So the fact that quarks are inside the protons and neutrons uh, in, the, in, the, in my detector. And then a further step, I have to convert it into the quantity for dark matter scattering over nucleons, uh, which are what I really see recoiling. Mm -hmm. So these, in general, are non-trivial steps uh, that involve uh, some form factors and some uh, other uh, uh, technicalities which are not uh, completely easy to, to explain, but uh, which can be done. Uh, it will in involve uh, further uncertainties, uh, like uh, indeed form factors and how the nuclei react whether the, when they are hit uh, by the dark matter particles and so on and so forth. And, uh, and so you have to keep it into account when, you when translating uh, results, uh, I mean events, uh, into, uh, into a plot like this. There are two typical cases that people consider for the quantity sigma scattering, which are uh, the spin independent one and the spin dependent one. So what I mean is that uh, you can be in the case in which uh, your particle physics, your microphysics, uh, spin dependent, spin independent. You can be in the case in which uh, your, your kind of mic microphysic interaction is such uh, that uh, it uh, couples independently on the spin of the, of the nucleus. Uh, and uh, this means that typically <coughs> it fills uh, the nucleus as a whole. So it fills uh, all the nucleons uh, inside the nucleon, uh, inside the nucleus uh, as, a, as a whole. Or you can be in the case in which uh, the microphysics is such that uh, dark matter couples uh, only to the total spin of the nucleus. Mm -hmm. So the spin dependent, uh, the interaction is spin dependent. It depends on how much uh, spin the nucleus, uh, the nucleus has. Mm -hmm. So in this case here, this quantity will be proportional to typically something like uh, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, combination of uh, quantities. A minus Z Fn to the power 2. So Fn and uh, Fp are the effective couplings of dark matter to protons and to neutrons. So basically, I'm, I've been doing this step. I'm moving to the interaction towards uh, against uh, nucleons. 
But anyway, assuming that they are essentially the same, uh, well, and then A and Z are the atomic uh, and the mass number of the, of the nucleus. So assuming that essentially these are the same, uh, it means that uh, in this case, uh, uh, this is proportional to the atomic number, no, the mass number, sorry, to the power 2. So you see that uh, you will be highly favored if you use uh, big nuclei. Nuclei with a large A, such as xenon or, uh, or, uh, or um, argon and so on, will be favored because uh, your spin, your uh, effective scattering cross section will be enhanced by a factor A to the 2. If instead you are in the spin dependent case, uh, your cross section will be proportional to J times J plus 1, which is the, the total spin uh, of, uh, of the nucleus. And in this case, uh, even if you go to large nuclei, you have no advantage because it depends only on the spin of the, of the, of the nucleus itself. You, you rather go to large spin nuclei, but I mean, you cannot go much higher than three thirds, uh, two, three halves or five halves or, or something like that. So typically constraints, I mean, detections of uh, these kind of interactions will be better placed than these kind of interactions because uh, simply of the different dependence uh, on, uh, on the physical parameters. So let me just give you an idea of uh, where the current, uh, the current uh, bounds and the current uh, sensitivities uh, sit. So let me leave the plane here. So let's consider some specific examples. So one example is the one that I showed there, so dark matter that interacts uh, with uh, a Z boson on, uh, let me write down explicitly now, the nucleus, so, so heating the nucleus. While you understand that this means uh, over quarks uh, dressed as nucleons uh, dressed inside a, nucleon, a nucleus. Okay, so there are several steps here. So the spin, in the, the spin independent cross section in this case will be proportional or actually of the order of something like uh, I mean, here I'm very much simplifying. I'm just giving some estimates that typically you get uh, something like this. Mass of the Z boson to the fourth. Mm -hmm. So the scattering cross-section will be proportional to uh, mass of the nucleus, which is heat to the power two, divided by the mass of the Z boson to the power four. You can more or less understand why this is the propagator, so it has to appear in that way in the scattering cross-section and so on. So this gives typically a cross-section. If I plug in the numbers uh, for, say, 100 GV nucleus and, uh, like, uh, xenon, mass of the Z boson and typical electroweak interactions, it gives me a cross-section which sits uh, somewhere here. So very much, uh, a very large cross-section, much higher than the currently uh, excluded, uh, excluded bounds. We are talking here about... Uh, 10 to the minus uh, 46, uh, I will show a plot in a moment, uh, 10 to the minus 46 uh, centimeters squared, uh, roughly speaking, uh, in the current, uh, in the current uh, best uh, determinations for a mass of 100 GV. So we sit uh, more or less here, which is to say particles that interact with the Z boson, with uh, ordinary matter, are excluded by orders of magnitude since uh, years now. Or I can have uh, particles uh, that interact, uh, the other example I gave before, dark matter particles that uh, do not interact with the Z boson, but interact uh, exchanging a Higgs uh, with uh, uh, the nucleus. So in this case, the parametrical uh, dependence of the scattering cross-section on, uh, on the, the quantities is given by alpha squared, where alpha now is some effective coupling of the Higgs uh, to the to, to matter there times uh, mn to the 4 divided by mass of the Higgs to the 6, uh, 125 GV to the, to the 6. If you plug in numbers, uh, you get that uh, in this case, uh, we are more or less uh, sitting, uh, say, here, I would say, for this kind of, uh, this kind of interactions. In some sense, uh, we are borderline between being killed uh, or being uh, on the verge of uh, of a discovery. So depending on the uh, actual parameters, depending on the actual precise masses of the things that you're looking at, you can be in an excluded region or in a still allowed, uh, still allowed region. How do you know how the Higgs 
No, indeed, you have to assume something. You have to say, okay, so it, uh, it uh, couples to an effective, uh, say, u cow over the one, effective u cow over the one. Uh, yeah, you have to assume something. Yeah, I mean, that would, uh, I'm saying that if you take order one, then you would sit more or less here, but nothing tells you it's order one. It can be 10 to the minus 11, and then uh, you're here. But in natural, in natural models, uh, this has to be, say, right, let's say, yeah. order. Mm. These are just, uh, I mean, hand waving. Eh? It's, it's just to give an idea where we sit, where what is allowed still and what is completely excluded already. And then instead, you can have uh, dark matter particles that do not couple to ordinary matter at three levels, so just exchanging one particle like this. But you can have a couple at uh, higher levels, so at one loop. For instance, take this diagram: dark matter, dark matter that couples uh, via two W bosons. Uh, to the nucleus here. OK, so this is uh, still the case, for instance, of a WIMP, a particle that interacts weakly, because this is a w the, the W boson, so it's a weak uh, gauge boson. If this coupling does not exist for some reason, so if uh, this is 0, then uh, this one is the next one which is relevant. And uh, this will be uh, typically suppressed with respect to this, because it's one loop process rather than uh, a three-level process. It will give you something like. Uh, um, alpha 4, electroweak, mass of the nucleus to the 4, divided by mass of the W to the power 6. And this kind of, uh, this kind of interactions, uh, this kind of uh, cross-sections typically sits uh, somewhere here. Mm? So in this case, uh, we are still very much safe uh, with respect to the, to the current bounds. There are examples of theories like this and can provide you with at least uh, one or two in which you are not killed yet uh, and uh, at some point uh, experiments will get uh, will get there so this is the current status of the constraints the true version of the plot that i sketched here uh, updated uh, to the latest results uh, april uh, this year i think so you see the exclusion curves and the shape uh, that i plotted there this is a uh, lux, uh, this is xenon, uh, the other experiments uh, that use a uh, different Edelweiss that I mentioned, CDMS that I mentioned. The most recent one and the most competitive one is uh, this one here that cuts uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 46 uh, centimeter square of cross section for a mass of about uh, 100, or say 50, 80 GV. So all this region here is excluded while this region here is still to be, uh, to be explored. You also see the fitting regions of the dam experiment uh, and uh, some others which are now a bit obsolete uh, because they, are do they do see a signal, as I was mentioning at some point. You may wonder, what is this, uh, the neutrino background? So this is uh, the region of the parameter space in which uh, neutrinos uh, coming from the sun, coming from the atmosphere, coming from past supernovae, and so on, will uh, look to you as dark matter. So we'll produce recoils uh, like uh, these, for instance, uh, or, or the others, uh, that will uh, fake a nuclear recoil and would, uh, I mean, would produce an irreducible background that you have to fight with in, at some point. So in some sense, people say this is a new neutrino floor, because when we get to this, uh, we'll not be able to go below we'll have something uh, irreducible. We start be seeing the neutrinos uh, recoiling against uh, the nucleus, uh, producing nuclear recoils, and so it will be difficult to go below. However, we can still uh, have room to get there. So these are the future experiments. Uh, as you see, they will uh, cover region of the parameter space. Uh, there is this particular uh, dark side and the LZ that are future experiments which are being designed right now that sooner or later will get to almost closing the windows uh, the window towards the neutrino, the neutrino floor at the level of 10 to the minus 48 uh, centimeters squared or something like this. So let's see, maybe at some point uh, one of these experiments finds uh, a, an unambiguous uh, signal of dark matter and we'll be all happy or maybe we get there and we see nothing and then we are even more in trouble. So uh, how much time do I have? While you, while you think, uh, I erase all this. Unless there are questions or...
15 minutes. So I will say something uh, quickly about uh, collider searches. And if, uh, if then I need some more time next week, I will. OK, so this will be very sketchy and qualitative. So the idea is that uh, we want to search for dark matter at colliders, which essentially means, or what I'm talking about here, essentially means uh, uh, the LHC at, uh, at, CERN's, at CERN. <coughs> so in terms of the diagrams that I've been uh, work, uh, using uh, in the past uh, few weeks, uh, what we are looking at is the collision of two dark matter particles, uh, two standard matter particles, uh, sorry. Uh, some uh, new physics uh, here, a blob of new physics of some sort uh, that uh, implies the production of two dark matter particles. Mm? So this is the, the scheme, but in, in real life what we are doing is that uh, we are colliding protons at the LHC. So essentially we are colliding, uh, well, I don't write protons, but I write the constituents of protons, which are quarks uh, and gluons, uh, which are inside the, the, the protons. Uh, that we do collide, and so what we have is uh, essentially this kind of diagram here. So we produce dark matter pairs of particles. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that uh, when you are uh, colliding uh, uh, two particles, you produce, uh, when you, you are colliding two protons, uh, you produce a dark matter particle, but uh, the dark matter particle, as we said so far in many, many instances, uh, flies away essentially without interacting. Mm? So here we are producing only a pair of dark matter particles, and so we're not exploiting the fact that uh, several are passing each second uh, in, in, uh, in the detector volume. Here we are producing only these two in some sense, and if they fly away and leave my detector undetected, then uh, I have a problem, right? So I have uh, uh, some, uh, some lack of detection. So how can, I, how can I do? Well, the point is that uh, this lack of detection is a problem, but it's also the feature that I'm looking for, in the sense that the signature that some dark matter has been uh, produced is uh, missing energy. Right? So I'm saying, uh, well, if I have a collision of two protons, uh, I'm oversimplifying, but if I have a collision of two protons and I see that nothing comes out, uh, or less than what I expected comes out, uh, so some energy is missing, then it means that it, it went into something that escaped undetected. And that is dark matter. And that is something that I can uh, look for. Actually, it's a bit more complex than that. I have to look for missing transverse energy. And the point is uh, that uh, uh, this collision uh, uh, happens uh, so let me, let me give you the sketch of what I'm talking about. So I'm colliding two protons, right? So I'm colliding a proton here and the proton here that goes uh, that go into this direction. This is the collision point. And uh, I have uh, the, the plane around the, 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 the collision point here. So here I can produce, uh, say, a couple of uh, dark matter particles that go away into different directions that I, will not, uh, that I will not detect. So the point is that into the protons here, I have uh, quarks and gluons, as I said. And I have, uh, say, several of them, the three valence quarks and then all the C quarks inside the, inside the protons. These uh, quarks uh, will share a different proportion. Let me, for simplicity, write down as if the proton was made of three quarks. Uh, will share a different proportion of the momenta of uh, uh, of the total of the total momentum of the proton. So if I collide this at 7 TeV and this at 7 TeV, these inside quarks will uh, uh, split uh, among themselves uh, the uh, 7 TeVs in different proportions, which depend on several parameters. So when I'm colliding uh, the two quarks, uh, two, two of these quarks, uh, I don't know exactly whether I'm colliding uh, these two or these two or these two. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the momentum along the longitudinal direction, the total momentum of the system along the longitudinal direction will not be zero. So the momentum 
along the longitudinal direction of the total number of particles. So of all the particles, uh, the, time, uh, the time colliding will, in general, be different from here. On the other hand, uh, the momentum along the transversal direction, so the, along the transversal direction of the all the particles uh, that I'm looking at, before the collision is certainly zero, right? So because the particles have no component, the quarks, uh, the, the protons, and then the, pro the quarks uh, have no component uh, allow around, uh, say, um, out of the axis of collisions. The beams are so collimated that you cannot have uh, any transverse component for the for the quarks, uh, other than along the longitudinal line. So when I do the collisions and I collect everything that comes out, visible, all the visible particles uh, that I can see, if uh, the total transverse momentum into visible particles is different from zero, then uh, I have uh, a signal of uh, missing transverse energy. OK? You, you understand the point, right? So you have to look uh, at uh, all uh, the final products uh, coming out uh, from the collision. Some, uh, they are transverse momentum, so in the transverse plane with respect to the axis of, collisions, of collision. And if you find something which is different from zero, then it means uh, that uh, something has gone into invisible particles before, because before the collision, this was zero, and this has to be conserved. Mm? So now you say, OK, that this is all easy, but uh, there are several things that can mimic uh, this kind of effect. For instance, I can produce neutrinos in, in my collision. Of course, I can produce neutrinos among many other things. Uh, and neutrinos are also particles that fly away undetected in a detector like ATLAS or, uh, or CMS. Uh, and so they will also fake uh, some uh, missing ET. That's true. That's uh, one of your backgrounds. Uh, you have to be able to simulate, uh, to, to say, model these backgrounds as, uh, as well as possible and be able to see uh, say anomalies uh, on top of the expected uh, missing uh, ET due to the standard model particles such as uh, in particular neutrinos. Or you can try to be sensitive to some uh, specific uh, quantities entering in the process such as the mass of the particle that leaves, not only the total energy but the mass of the particle that leaves. Uh, this is not so easy but you can devise uh, some specific kinematical quantities that distinguish between an almost massless particle and a heavy particle like dark matter that goes out and hope to see something, uh, to something at some point. So I would say that, uh, <coughs> so let's say, what I'm saying here is that uh, missing ET, missing uh, transverse energy, is the crucial signature. You have to have this uh, in your collider uh, events to say, OK, something has happened. But then uh, there are, say, strategies uh, to de design strategy, strategies to, uh, to, do this, to do the analysis. And let me sketch a little bit what they are. So the first strategy, which is the most, uh, in some sense, uh, historical or ancient, if you want, uh, is that uh, you look for missing ET and uh, um, other plus uh, other particles which are produced uh, in uh, the underlying theory that, that, uh, that uh, encompasses dark matter. Let me explain in a second what I mean. So for instance, suppose that you are uh, in, a, in supersymmetry, so in a supersymmetric uh, model of, uh, of your choice, uh, whatever it is. So your supersymmetric model of your choice, uh, <coughs> so first of all, this is the strategy that people have been using uh, in for decades, uh, say, since uh, the 70s and the past colliders or, or so. so sit uh, in a specific model such as supersymmetry and compute uh, the signatures uh, that you would get uh, pl plus missing ET in this specific model and go and look for them at colliders. For instance, 
in uh, supersymmetry, you could have that, uh, in some specific model supersymmetry, you could have that uh, two protons collide and produce uh, something like uh, a gluino. Mm, so the supersymmetric pattern of the gluon, which is uh, typically easy to produce at the LHC because it's a particle with strong charge, so typically couples to the, to the protons. This gluino, because in your model uh, it does so, it would uh, decay into a squark and uh, producing uh, a quark here. And this quark uh, will give you a hadronic jet. And then in your model, typically this uh, squark goes into a heavy neutralino. Let's call <coughs> it uh, chi 0 2. I'm just flashing, I mean, naming names. Uh, it's not particularly important, but you just get, get an idea. Producing a quark here. So this is another jet. And then this heavy neutralino decays itself uh, into a slepton. Mark, Carlos, you can correct me if this is not correct. Producing a lepton, saying a muon, for instance. Uh, and then this one goes into the dark matter. So I have to put the yellow here. The dark matter and uh, producing another lepton, say, for instance, uh, for instance uh, a, a another muon. So you know that this is what happens in your model, and actually they're symmetrical on the other side. And so you look for events in, the, in LHC in which you have uh, missing ET plus, uh, if I did correct the uh, computation, four jets plus uh, four leptons, uh, plus four jets and four leptons. Okay, so you have missing ET that comes from the fact that the matter flies away, and then you have uh, the four jets from this and the symmetrical process, uh, and the four, uh, then the four leptons there. If you see something like this, uh, you know that uh, you have produced something which is, in this model, consistent uh, with, uh, with the dark matter particle. So people have been doing this uh, for decades uh, and years, uh, years or decades, uh, <coughs> and uh, excluding a more or less large portion of the parameter space that I will show in a minute. It's very effective, but you understand that it's completely model dependent. So you have to do this for each model that you choose at the beginning. So if you take some assumptions and you see what should come out, uh, you go and look for it. So the completely orthogonal, in some sense, uh, strategy is to say, OK, I want to be completely model independent. And I look for generic signatures uh, of uh, a collision of, of protons uh, producing dark matter. So for instance, consider the case in which uh, you have a proton that collides with a proton. And uh, only the dark matter particle is produced here. Mm. So if this is the case, I will see nothing, OK? Because I, I cannot say uh, I, I don't have any visible product that comes out, so I don't know whether the protons collided or not. I can consider the case in which just before colliding, so to speak, these one of these protons, uh, say, emits, uh, for instance, uh, a photon uh, or, a, or a quark that becomes a jet. Uh, or, uh, or, uh, or a Higgs particle or something else. So I will detect this thing and nothing else. So I can look for the so-called mono gamma, mono photon, or mono jet, or mono whatever uh, processed at the LHC. So the signature here is uh, missing ET plus a single particle emitted, uh, essentially, for the, from the initial state. So this is completely model independent now, because you're not specifying uh, anything of what happens uh, inside the, the collision point, right? So you're just saying, if I see that something has been produced uh, by, the, by, by these two particles that were colliding, and then I don't see anything there, it must have gone into dark matter. And so this is a more... Uh, this is, a, in some sense, a more, a more model-independent signature and a, a, a cleaner one. You can also have the intermediate uh, cases uh, in which uh, you say, actually, uh, let's call it uh, 1.5. So it's intermediate between uh, 1 and, uh, and 2, in which uh, you look for, uh, um, say, generic, but not too generic classes of signals, uh, such as, for instance, uh, let me call it generic uh, topologies of signals, such as, for instance, this one. Say you have two protons that collide, as usual. 
and you say that you want to produce uh, two jets uh, which are rather forward. So they are in the same direction of uh, the two protons which are colliding, plus uh, missing ET, which is uh, due to the dark matter particles that fly away in another, in another direction. So this is, for instance, the case of, uh, it's called forward eye jets. And uh, die forward in the sense that they go more or less along the line uh, of the impinging particles, the protons, uh, and the die jets in the sense that there are uh, two of them uh, uh, almost uh, back to back, uh, plus missing ET. This is particularly powerful because it applies uh, to different uh, topologies, so you don't have to sit uh, specifically into one model like it's the case there. You don't have to be completely model independent like uh, it is the case here but you can adapt uh, different models uh, to produce uh, something like this uh, that, you can, uh, that you can look for. So let me show you some examples before we finish, uh, really two minutes. Okay, so this is what I said already. The signature is uh, something like this or something like this or something uh, intermediate. And then you have to interpret that. So if you interpret, uh, so, so we, we, you, you do see uh, missing ET, and then you see some of the other uh, signatures. Uh, hopefully, at some point at the LHC, you see some of the other signatures that I, that I mentioned here. And you can try to interpret that. You can interpret that uh, in, a, in a full theory, such as, for instance, supersymmetry, the constrained MSSM, or the phenomenological MSSM, or whatever. So you can uh, impose uh, constraints uh, on the parameter space of the model, which uh, typically involves uh, 10 or even hundreds of parameters. You select uh, some of them, uh, for instance, M0 and 1 half, uh, which, are, which were very popular years and years ago. And you see that uh, if the LHC has seen nothing, you can exclude dark matter to sit uh, into, these, uh, into these regions here. This is just to give an idea. I don't want uh, to enter too much into the details. Or you can interpret things uh, effectively. So you can say, OK, if uh, I have this diagram here, I collapse in an effective field theory by considering that this is a point interaction with uh, a scale uh, lambda, suppressing it. So I'm looking at these operators here, of which a full list uh, is there. And I can impose uh, constraints uh, in the plane of the dark matter mass and the suppression scale lambda, or M star, which is typically what comes out from uh, Atlas uh, or, or CMS. Um, now, this is subject to several assumptions. Maybe it's better if I stop here and uh, recap this next week, because otherwise I have to go too fast. OK, Kay, so let's stop here. I have a few other slides that I'll put online, but we'll discuss them uh, next week. It's better. OK, so if there are no questions. <coughs>